everyone, and welcome to our Life of Jesus Bible Study. I'm your host, Cynthia Blaze, the Director of Women's Ministries of La Jolla Presbyterian Church. This year, we are going to read through all four Gospels as a continuous story together. We're going to try to keep in mind the original intention of each writer, but also see how we draw closer to the person of Jesus by reading them as a whole. We're going to see if we can piece together a timeline also for the three years Jesus ministers on earth and find where the pieces of each Gospel fit into that timeline. My prayer is that we will all grow in our understanding of the message of Jesus, grow closer to him personally, and therefore be better able to share that message of love with those around us. I invite you to listen into this recording of our Wednesday morning Bible study and be encouraged. All right. Hello, ladies. <clears throat> How is everyone today? I... Uh, May sound a little nasally. I uh, hi Jennifer. <laughs> um, I yes. I need a whistle. Whistle. I don't have a loud voice today either. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. I I need you every week. Will you do that every week? That was amazing. Um, forgive me if I sound nasally. I came down with a sinus infection when we were in the Galapagos, and um, I still feel like I'm hearing in a tunnel, and which has been freaking out my children because maybe this is a blessing. Maybe I should just not hear them on a general basis. Maybe it'll make life more enjoyable. I don't know, but yeah, my... um, I am, I am not hearing as well, and I have a doctor appointment this afternoon to make sure that everything is fine. But it is great, to actually, in some ways, to get sick in Latin America because I got sick. I texted my friend, hey, I think I have a sinus infection. What should I take? And she says, uh, take this. And I walked into the pharmacy and for $3 purchased my antibiotic and went on it. So that's the difference about medical care, I guess, <laughs> in Latin America. Um, and actually the same thing. My son got sick and he got a fever and I was like, we are not going to like even like like freak I, I just I didn't want it to even have any option of it getting worse and so same thing we put him on amoxicillin that day and it was fever was gone and he was better and it was great so the benefits and that again was three dollars <laughs> so um I hope you ladies had a good week off last week and a little rest and did something extra fun uh we did have a a great trip it was uh, I, it was a lot it was my first time traveling um, adventure style traveling with a six and a half and a nine-year-old and um they actually did amazing but it was definitely a lot. It was, um, it was a lot of travel, a lot of planes, a lot of boats, and just keeping them moving. Everything was new. The food was new. The Stella found this food that she loved. It's called salty papas. And all it is is French, frog, French fries and hot dog bites. And that was amazing. So everywhere I wish she went, she'd just be like, salty papas. <laughs> and so I don't think my children ate anything green the entire trip, but they did survive on hot dogs and French fries. <laughs> so that was good. Um, and um, I'll tell you one funny story. It was just a, a fabulous parenting moment of mine where, so, you know, my Stella, she, you guys know, you ladies know that she gets nervous in new situations and that's just something that we work through with her. And so she, we went to Cancun in November for the sole purpose, not sole purpose, but one of the main purposes of really getting my kids snorkeling because we knew that going on this big trip we needed them to be able to be very confident in the water and snorkeling to see all these crazy things we we're going to see. But that was still a little bit of a stretch for my six and a half year old daughter. And so she, we would bundle her up in a little wetsuit and put on her life jacket and put fins on her. So she just was floating, you know, like this. And I would always hold her hand. And so, um, and one of the most amazing things, things to see down in the Galapagos is these ginormous sea turtles, like ginormous, like this big, like so big that you just, you can't, they're so big. They're like bigger than my dad. Like they're so big and they're incredible. Like they move slow. Like, you know, it's like the whole world is in slow motion to a sea turtle and they would just rest on the bottom and we would snorkel in this very shallow area, you know, four or five feet deep. And these huge sea turtles would just be resting 
on the sand underneath us. And so this one time, Stella and I are very slowly, like we're not even swimming, we're just more like drifting, you know, drifting slowly over a couple of sea turtles. And we get right over one of these massive ones. And at that moment, he decides that he wants a breath. And so he starts to surface, starts to slowly come up. And we're literally over him. And my daughter has been told, and she's a rule follower, my daughter has been told that you are not supposed to touch the sea life. Like, no, we don't touch anything. You know, this is a big deal. We're not going to touch anything. So suddenly this massive sea turtle is surfacing. It's coming up. I'm holding her hand. And so my great parenting moment is I'm worried that this thing is going to hit us. And so I push her away so that the thing surfaces between us. Okay? So... This thing does. It comes up its sweet little head, takes its little breath, and then slowly descends down. But at that moment, Stella is separated from me by this ginormous sea turtle. She freaks out, kicks the sea turtle with her fin, and then freaks out even more because she's now she's broken the cardinal rule of the Galapagos, and she touched a sea animal. So she's, like, completely losing it. And, she, <laughs> and like... And, I mean, maybe I probably should have pushed her and tried to swim her direction, but it's not like split second decision where I was just like, ah, it's coming up and pushed her away. So that was not maybe my finest moment, but it was, it was, it was in retrospect quite hilarious actually. So, um, so we had a great trip. Um, we are all back safe and sound and healthy, which is good. And I'm, a, I'm excited to dive in with you ladies today. So let me pray for us and get my mind focused. Um, I hope if I, I, I hope that I will be a hundred percent as on as I typically am uh, with my head cold. So you know, maybe you ladies will answer some questions for me today. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. But I know it's going to be a great study. So Jesus, thank you for this time that we have together, and thank you for these wonderful women, and thank you for this experience that we had of, of seeing your incredible creation and being able to travel. And I pray that now, as we are back here together, that you will focus our minds and our hearts on you. I pray that you will pour your spirit out into this room. I pray that you will help me to teach only what is true. Grant us all your wisdom and insight that we will hear and understand your word and be drawn closer to you in the process. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so today we are again only going to be in the book of Luke. So if you brought your Bibles, that is great. If not, maybe share with a neighbor. Um, <clears throat> oh, and then I did. This was my other little announcement. We are on the final leg of selling Girl Scout cookies for my 60-year-old daughter. So if anybody would like the uh, one of the final boxes that I have, it's over there, $5. You are welcome to take a Girl Scout cookie. Okay, so... As we are diving back in, just to remind ourselves, we are doing a gospel study. We are studying all four gospels together, and we are trying to understand how they fit together and show us the timeline of Jesus' three years of ministry. Uh, None of the gospels were intended to be a full biography, but all of them um, have a theological purpose and a message that they are communicating. They began as oral stories. They were written onto scrolls that were then combined into the larger works that we currently have. We believe Mark was likely written first. He was the companion of Paul and then later Peter, and we believe he writes from Peter's perspective to a Gentile audience. Luke, our investigator, the companion of Paul, was likely the second gospel that was written, and he's trying to tell the full story of the, of the teachings of Jesus. Matthew, a disciple or eyewitness, likely the third one written and definitely to a Jewish audience. And then John, another disciple, also an eyewitness who wrote last and believed that his goal was to tell the unwritten stories and to clarify some theological truths. So let's start by again asking the question today, where are we in the life of Jesus today? Let's set our context. So we believe, again, that John the Baptist likely began preaching in about AD 29, and that Jesus began his ministry either in about AD 30 or 31, more likely AD 30. Uh, Four weeks ago, we saw Jesus go to the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in Jerusalem. That was likely the fall of AD 32, probably September of AD 32. Um, in believing that Jesus was likely crucified in April of AD 33. Um, that means, again, we are in the sort of final six months of Jesus' life. Is that my phone? Fabulous. <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Great. 
carry it on. So um, we saw uh, we saw Jesus leave Galilee. Scripture says does not say that he returns after he leaves. That he said it says that he sets his face towards Jerusalem and begins a slow journey that's going to end in Passion Week. We almost feel this sense of foreboding as we are in these last four months or last final months of Jesus's life. Jesus has already spoken to Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration. He knows what lies ahead for him. They have already told him um, at that meeting. They told him, "You are going to die." And that's it's this great little. I mean, it's only like one line, but it says that they talked about his death and what was to come. So Jesus has had this conversation on the transfiguration. He knows what lies before him at this point. So Jesus has also now told his disciples two times already, I am going to be killed um, by the Jewish leaders and I am going to rise again. So it's very clear that he said this. Last week we saw Jesus send out the 72 disciples to prepare the towns around Jerusalem to hear his message ultimately to prepare them to also hear the message of him being raised from the dead, because these are going to be the first towns that will the news of him being raised from the dead will also spread to. So we saw him visit Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication, which was Hanukkah, likely December of AD 32. And at that point is when we think he most likely stayed with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And we get that great little story of Mary and Martha and serving him. And, At the end of our session, we saw Jesus withdraw again to Perea, the wilderness outside Jerusalem, across the Jordan River. So today, we will see what Jesus taught in Perea, that area outside of Jerusalem. And it's only recorded by Luke, which is interesting. He's the one person that gives us the teachings that Jesus did at this last little time period. He's done his teachings in Galilee. He's left Galilee. He knows the crosses before him. And he's teaching outside of Jerusalem in the Judean wilderness. So uh, it's an interesting time knowing that his crucifixion lies ahead of him, very close. Um, you know, we've passed this feast of dedication of Hanukkah. Um, and so we really think at this point we're in the final four months of Jesus's life. Uh, Jesus has, um, has taught in Galilee, and, but now he's teaching in Jerusalem. And we get to listen in to what are these conversations. What is he teaching this new set of people that he hasn't taught yet? Um, it seems also that as we start today, that it was a really large group of people that he was teaching. We're going to see Luke set the context for us and then see Jesus focus actually his teachings to his disciples. The first set, section that we're going to read through seems to be kind of a collection of Jesus' teachings to his disciples. Um, and just keep in mind as we read through that we're only three to four months out from when Jesus is going to be killed. So he's really trying to instill sort of a sense of final teachings and final words on what his disciples really need to know. So we're going to start in Luke 12, and I'm just going to start with verses 1 through 3 to start us off. So meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered, so they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. <laughs> Let's start with that just for a moment. So, okay, how large of a crowd is gathered? What does it say in verse 1? Thousands. So much so that they are trampling on each other, right? Like, that's kind of intense. Um, but Jesus focuses his teaching on who does it say? His disciples. Right. It's really similar to the Sermon on the Mount in some ways, in the sense that a huge crowd has gathered, but he's going to pull in his inner disciples right in front of him to be the ones that he's going to focus his teaching on. And Jesus tells his disciples to be on their guard against the yeast of the Pharisees. So, and then he names that yeast. What is that yeast in verse one? Hypocrisy. Exactly. So what is the hypocrisy of the Pharisees that we've seen so far in our study? What are the, what is their big hypocrite? What are they hypocritical about? Follow the, the law no matter what. Follow the law no matter what. And over over what? The law is more important than what? The heart. The heart. Exactly. Exactly. That our our outer spiritual actions are what are more important is really what the Pharisees seem to be focused on versus truly caring for people or truly worshiping God. You know, if someone is healed on the Sabbath, they're more ca- they're more concerned that this is breaking the law. Something was healed. Someone was an action was taken on the Sabbath versus someone was healed. And Jesus is continually saying, you need to care about the person. You need to care about 
this, you know, this child of God, not that this law was, you think this law was broken. So it's a sort of this outward spiritual actions. Um, and then as a reminder, what does yeast do? What does yeast do? It spreads. And do you see it spreading? No, it's very quiet, but it's also powerful, right? You put a little bit of yeast into dough and the whole thing is leavened, right? Um, so how is hypocrisy like yeast? It's, it spreads like rumors. Totally. It sounds logical, but it's, it's not. It gets bigger. That's a great, yeah. It gets increased, right? Exponentially, totally. This little tiny bit of yeast influences this huge piece of dough. So, you know, I was thinking about this. Um, so, so for hypocrisy being like yeast, it's like, it's kind of like it quietly influences others, right? That it begins... It's sort of like the sense of beginning to care more about our outward spiritual actions versus our inward heart. And that if we're kind of doing that, if we're sort of displaying this outward spirituality, it's kind of easy to be caught up in that, I think. So, and I was thinking, you know, can we be like that at times? Can we care more about how we are sort of spiritually perceived? And I think that, I think that can be easy for us. And I was thinking, can you ladies even give me some answers or some thoughts and like, how, um, how could, where, what are specific ways? Not that you do this. This is not personal confession, but what ways in our culture could we be more caring more about how we are spiritually perceived? You, you know, what things are easy for us to focus on? Any ideas, any thoughts? People going to church. Just going to church. Totally showing up in our cute clothes or <laughs> what was that? A cute hat. <laughs> what was that? Sweats and tennis shoes. <laughs> totally. You can get away without the 10 o'clock service. <laughs> um, yeah, what other ways do we sort of focus more on how we are perceived spiritually, how, what we look like in our outward actions? Well, just the obvious ones like wearing crosses. Wearing crosses, Bible. carrying a Bible. Mm-hmm. Totally. I was even thinking about like social media, you know, what we post. Like having, what are we portraying to people around us? Caring more about coming down really hard on the um, the, the taboos that we think are mm. um, really bad versus right. the ones that kind of just get in under the radar. Yeah, caring more about sort of the big Christian taboos than like the little things, like caring more about you know <coughs> divorce or the big sort of the big things versus like gossip. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Telling people about your good deeds. Telling people about your good yeah. deeds. Absolutely. Totally. Look how amazing I am. <laughs> totally. So I was thinking about that. So I think it's, you know, we come down so hard on the Pharisees, but I think it's easy to also see how we can also be like that, you know, caring about our outward actions as Christians, our outward spirituality. Um, and so then what is the point of the, uh, the verses that round out this section. I'll reread them. So um, 12, 2, and 3. So there's nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you've said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you've whispered in the ear in the inner room will be proclaimed from the roofs. Just about how God hears the, the truth. God hears the truth, exactly. That was going to be my question. How do these verses relate to the sort of spiritual exterior? Is God knows. God knows what we say to a friend, Right. God knows, God knows our, our true hearts of, and not, he knows more than the outward, yeah, why, we do things. why we do things, our motivation. Totally, totally. Yeah. I was thinking like I, I, with social media, you know, maybe again, only people know what I post on social media, you know, but on, on Instagram or Facebook, but God knows my actual heart. He knows like my motivation for doing things. So, um, God knows what I truly care about when, when I, what I say, even in secrecy to a friend, you know, the, the sense of being, and part of that's amazing. The sense of being fully known by God, that he is so intimately involved in our lives that he knows these conversations that we have. But I think it's also, you know, slightly terrifying too. It's an amazing combination that, so, and then the next group of sayings, um, 
the common word that's going to run through them is the word fear. And we're going to see how that kind of fleshes out. So I'm going to pick up in 12.4. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after your body has been killed has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. So according to these verses, who shouldn't we fear? Verse 4. Who should we not fear? Everybody around uh, and specifically it says those who could kill the body. Right. So why shouldn't we fear them? There's no power, truly. Right. They only have they can only harm us physically, right? They can't impact our eternity. That someone could harm us, but that doesn't change you going to heaven or not. You know, that doesn't change your relationship with Jesus. So then who should we fear, according to verse 5? Yeah, him who could throw us into hell. So, which is kind of God. So now I think that in the biblical understanding of the word fear is wider than our English actually expresses. That when we think of being afraid of something, what do we? Th- what other words come to your mind? Like in English sense, if I'm afraid of something, what other words? Terror. Yeah. What? What else was that? Scared, petrified. Exactly. Like all those words come into our mind when we think of fear. But I. So the sort of like dread and terror, and they're a form of sort of the picture we get in Scripture of God, but they're not the total understanding of God, that when we think of fear of God, what other words come to your minds? Reverence, awe, awe, totally, exactly. Um, So in some ways, then, how can fear be constructive for us? How can fear be good for us? Motivate you to move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Keep you humble. I like that. But to be motivated by awe yeah. is much different than to be motivated by... Like terror. terror. Yeah, to be motivated by awe is a different motivation than terror, dread. Totally. In the, you know, in the Old Testament, God was, that was everyone was fearful of him. Yeah. Fearing of God. So, I mean, this is still pretty strong if he's trying to teach and get across the love of God. And totally. Yeah, it's yeah that these words are are so very strong, and I think that's the amazing thing about God is that He's all of it. It's like He's big enough to be the Creator God who can create everything and is in charge of everything. You know, more powerful than any other spiritual voice, um, spiritual force. You know, that when we see people in Scripture encountering God, it's often this falling on the ground in sort of like fear and worship that being to be in the presence of God is an overwhelming feeling, but that same God loves us is what's crazy. And actually that's kind of the comparison they're going to go into right here. Basically tell us, well, that you're, you are going to test, you are going to be in fear of these things that are going to happen. Kind of like a I, of telling absolutely. Of God, but it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Keep right. praying in the name of, of our God and doing his works. And that's totally eternal salvation. If you turn away, which they all will, <laughs> point, yeah. they, um, that's not what he's advocating. He's saying, ignore the fear of, of these people and, and the things that are going to happen to you in order to proclaim his word and go forward and, and multiply. I think you're, you have it right on. I think you've nailed it. I think because this is, again, why we love to study Scripture in context, because we're also understanding what he's saying is lying ahead of them. He's saying, don't be afraid of what's going to happen in the next couple of months, because it was all about to go down. You know, the showdown was about to happen. Don't be afraid of what's going to happen. Don't be afraid of being, of having, of being killed even. Like, don't be afraid of that, because I got you still. So it is an amazing 
you're right. When we think of it, what, you know, who he's speaking to and what is about to happen is a great sense of context. Um, I was thinking about how can fear be constructive or a good thing. I think in some ways it's a sense of um, realizing our own sinfulness, realizing our own need for forgiveness. You know, when we see ourselves as we truly are in relationship to this perfect God that, you know, think of, of Adam and Eve when they bit that apple and what did they do? They hid. Exactly. They were suddenly afraid of God. Right. And that, um, and I read in a commentary, the fear is like a natural consequence of sin. You know, when we do something wrong and we get this sense of that being revealed or found out, fear is kind of a natural consequence of that. Uh, we know we've done something wrong, so we fear God. So there's a sense that we should fear God in these verses. We should fear the one who is authority over heaven and hell. Um, but then these verses are immediately followed by the reminder of how much God loves us, which is just this great comparison. Were you going to ask something? Uh-huh. Versus fear. Fear usually elicits action and awe like freeze you. Oh interesting. The awe is sort of a, a freezing and fear is sort of an action. Right. So maybe yeah. maybe there's some intent there. Of being impelled or propelled into action. Mm-hmm. That's a great observation. I like that. I yeah. Fear. It's usually imminent. It's usually mm, fear is imminent. You don't think it's twenty years from now. Right. Somebody's thinking me or something. Right. I'm afraid now. Yeah. 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 Cover up for Adam and Eve covering up their nakedness. Well, you know, God was the unknown God. Yeah. And you were fearful of him. And I thought when Christ became man and walked among them, everyone, he was knowable. Right. So we have this. Unknown God, now known. Yes. And yeah, that Jesus was preaching love. Absolutely. But I think it's also a reminder that he still is preaching, uh, remember who you are in comparison to God. You know, you need forgiveness. We all have to repent and turn to God. We need forgiveness. But the amazing thing is that Jesus covers over all of the, every, you know, all of our sin and, and wrong. Elizabeth. Where do we get our moral conscience from? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> if you don't believe God, do you have a moral conscience? I, yeah. I, my sense is it comes from having a soul. That's what separates us from animals. And that in the Garden of Eden, it, or the creation, it says that God breathed his life into Adam. And the sense of a soul. I believe, I, I don't know. I mean, what do you ladies think? I think that we all have a moral conscience. I think that we can listen to it in varying degrees. Um, but I think, I mean, I think everybody through, you know, all civilizations have a code, right? We all, you know, in varying degrees have, if you go too fast, the police officer is going to pull you over. You know, it's not okay to murder. It's not okay to steal. It's not, like the basic Ten Commandments are the moral code, I think, of humanity. It's not okay to commit adultery. Like we all sort of internally believe that, whether we all act according to it or not. So my sense is that it is in us. But whether we listen to it or not is our, is, and, and it's the result, too, of even the circumstances are raised in and the sins done to us. You know, I mean, there's a lot that is part of that all. So when we come to know Christ, then our spirit is made alive. Yeah, our spirit is made alive when we come to know Jesus. Right. 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 That's the difference in really being sort of uh, perceiving the moral code too, wanting to follow it and being empowered to follow it. Like I say to my kids all the time, like, cause they're stinkers to each other is, you know, when you are mad, 
it's not that you can just will yourself to be kind to your sister. It's you need the power of the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus, help me be kind. And they don't really do that yet. But, you know, I'm going to keep telling them that until maybe someday they will. But, you know, it's like we can't will ourselves to be better people or into kindness. It's we need the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. And we need a moment by moment to help us, you know, when we're stinking mad at someone, if I'm mad at my husband, I have to shut my mouth. I have to pray, Holy Spirit, give me wisdom right now. And then probably I have to not open my mouth. So, but you know, like that's, it's a daily thing for all of us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do, to be kind, to do good works. It doesn't come on our own. Carolyn. <laughs> you fear, about right? You fear your parents, but absolutely. Theoretically, your parents love you anyway. Totally, but they still love you. That was like a good motivator. Yeah. Like, I, I, I don't want to be caught. <laughs> <laughs> totally, and I think that's a really great example. And I think that's why God calls Himself a Father, yeah. is because He wants us to understand Him according to that template. Yeah. You know. We all have to understand totally. Him. Or a child of someone. Totally. That's like, I, you, know, you do have things you fear, but the, theoretically, your parents love you even yes, though you, but it does totally. accountable. Totally. Terrible. And that's a great uh, image, too, because we also, as those of us who are parents or grandparents, know that we discipline for good, right? I'm not disciplining my child because I don't want him to have any fun. You know, I want him to be kind, and I want him to be a good person. And I think that that's, I think, again, that's why God really uses that, that sense of him being a father because we understand what it is to be disciplined but to be completely loved. I mean, that's not the case I know in our humanity. Not everybody has a great dad. But at its heart, at its core, I think that's where it is a great vision of who God is. Okay, let's do these last verses. So um, because it's great that as soon as he talks about fear, he then goes into the sense of being totally known and totally loved. So I'm going to reread um, verses, uh, for, let's see, where am I? <laughs> yes. Um, five. thank you. Five, six through seven. Sorry. Just getting down to where am I in my notes after all that great discussion, ladies. I love it. Okay. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet none of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. So, if five spares are sold for two pennies, is that a large price? No. So these birds that seem to cost almost nothing to be insignificant, even them are individually known by God. And God knows us so much that he actually knows how many hairs are on each of our heads. I actually have a really funny story about this, a little side. So we were, we were driving to our friend's house a couple of months ago, our friends, um, good friends of ours, Bob and Lisa, and um, somehow we got into this discussion of how much God knows us. I think my son, my little theologian in the making, says, Mom, isn't it amazing that there's like six billion people and like God knows each of us? Like it was just kind of this like mind explosion moment for him. And I said, yeah, buddy. And... Um, so the friends that we were going to go visit, our friends Bob and Lisa, Bob actually has shaved his head. So he has no hair on his head, okay? It's just his style. He looks, he looks awesome. It's just his style. So we're going to visit these friends. And so I say to them, I think, yeah, isn't it amazing? God knows us so much. He actually knows how many hairs on, our, on each of our heads. And then my little Stella from the back seat pipes up, I know how many hairs are Mr. Bob's head. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I was dying. It was so quick. <laughs> it was so funny. So, but the idea is that we get this picture, you know, of this God who has all authority in heaven and over heaven and hell, knows us and loves us so individually, so uniquely, so intimately that he knows the number of hairs on each of our heads. I mean, that's like a crazy powerful image. And I love that that's the images that he bookends together. You know, we get this sense of to fear God. Yes, but this same God that has all power 
and authority knows and loves us so intimately. And that's, I think, the whole picture of God in those comparisons. So, um, so why do you think that Jesus lays out this contrast to his disciples, just knowing what's lying ahead of them? This is just conjecture or thoughts from you ladies. He knows what's ahead. ahead. Exactly. Right. Right. And exactly. And he knows what's going to happen after, after he dies, because suddenly, you know, there's going to be this explosion of the church. And a lot of these disciples are going to be martyred. So he knows what lies ahead for them. And it is, it's a sense of preparing them. Don't fear who can kill your body. Know that you are loved and you are uniquely cared for. So, uh, and yeah, and, and that he was teaching them these words in front of thousands. That's a great point. So Jesus ends this collection of teachings with really exactly an encouragement for what lies ahead for his disciples. Um, okay, so then let's, let's finish that. So I'm going to skip down to verses 11 and 12. And he says, <clears throat> when you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do you not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say? For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Um, and so notice the, word, the, the sentence starts with the word when. When you are brought before synagogues and rulers and authority. Um, when this happens is near future for them at this point. You know, again, we know that we're in probably within the last four months of Jesus' death and resurrection. So it's 40 days after his resurrection that the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And these same disciples that are here right now are going to be the ones that are set on fire. So um, Peter and John are going to be pulled before the Sanhedrin to give an account for the healings that they start doing. This is only months away. This is, you know, that all begins 40 days after his resurrection. So we're at, you know, five months out from when this is all going to start happening, maybe six. Um, so when the disciples are brought before authorities, when they are facing martyrdom, as many of them will, um, it says, what should they not worry about? In verse 11, what should they not worry about? What to say, how to defend themselves. Exactly. Uh, and why, according to verse 12, the Holy Spirit will teach them at that time what to say. Um, so it was funny. I was reading a commentary and it was saying that now this is not a prescription for pastors to get up unprepared on a Sunday morning <laughs> or for me to not prepare for this Bible study. You know, that's not what this is saying. Oh, I'm just going to get up and the Holy Spirit is going to tell me what to say. You know, like that's not what it's saying. Um, so, you know, what do you think that means for us today in our lives? What does it mean that the Holy Spirit gives us what to say at the right moment? I think, yeah, he does. Absolutely. I think that, you know, I think if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, having an intimate relationship with the Lord the whole, and the Holy Spirit's in us, that we can walk in that. And, um, I mean, haven't you done that? Haven't you? Had Absolutely. That, that you go, wow, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> totally. Because <laughs> it's not me. Totally. That when we're walking in intimacy with Jesus, that we will. We will have these great times of the Holy Spirit just speaking right. through us. And probably a lot of you have had experiences like that. I was thinking about how, just for me, what I've gotten in the habit whenever I'm having a conversation with someone, if I kind of feel like it could be going towards spiritual matters, that I'll just say, like a really little prayer if I had, quick one, just saying, you know, Jesus, give me the words to say to this person that's in front of me. Or even sometimes if I even feel like I'm t- I have moments where I'm talking to someone and I get this sense like, oh my gosh, maybe I'm supposed to share, like we're supposed to get there. And I'll sort of do that prayer, like, God, if you want us to have this conversation, open up the doors, create the opportunity, give me the words to say when, you know, when that happens. And so that's definitely something that I do a lot, you know, with with moms on the field, you know, on the soccer field. Like if it just, if I just feel that sense from someone that I'm supposed to invite them to church or I'm supposed to invite them to Bible study, that. I do. I just sort of step back in my head and just give that little. Or even not talking. Or not talking at sometimes. That's a great point too. Actually, with, I have a son, and, mm. and he not, doesn't always talk. And sometimes when he's talking to me, I'm realizing that I'm listening and I'm not adding, and I'm thinking, "Thank you, Lord," because mm. you know he has to feel that environment to share. God 
guys just don't. They don't that much. Yeah. It's like I'm savoring it. That's awesome. When your son is sharing yeah. with you and you're feeling like, I need to not open my mouth right now. <laughs> like, totally. Totally. Um, so after these teachings, um, Jesus is then actually drawn in to teach this whole crowd by a question. So I'm going to keep going. I'm going to read actually all verses 13 through 21, and then we'll look back at it a little bit. So someone in the crowd said to him, now, I, just again, as a reminder, you know, our Bibles will break up um, these paragraphs with little titles, like mine suddenly transitions to the parable of the rich fool. But that would not have been in our original text. And so they just would have followed one after another. So we would have ended with, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Someone in the crowd said to him, it just all flowed together. So, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And then I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Okay, so a man asked Jesus to settle a personal dispute between him and someone else. Now, we know actually historically that there were small Sanhedrin in every town that would be designed for this kind of thing if you have a dispute with a neighbor. So... Um, So Jesus tells this man, that's not what he came to do. I'm not here to settle your earthly disputes. And then he turns, it's just great. He turns it onto this man, right? And he says, um, turns the desire back on him and warns him. And what does he warn him against? Greed, exactly. Saying life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. True happiness and joy do not come from what we own. And it's interesting, um, you know, scientists have actually studied income and happiness. I don't know if you have seen any of these things out there. Um, have found that up to a certain point that having a certain, having a certain amount of income does lead to greater happiness in the sense that you can go out to dinner and buy a car or buy a house or go to the movies, go on vacation. There's a certain sense of a certain amount of money that actually does aid happiness in our culture. But... Uh, so what, ladies, okay, this is my question. What income do you think that is? Any thoughts? 120,000? 150,000? Depends on where you live. <laughs> In La Jolla, it might be a little different. <laughs> um, so the number that came, off nas- come, came across nationally, so now we probably would want to maybe raise this $25,000 for us here in La Jolla, but it was $75,000 that earning up to $75,000 did make you in some ways happier. But the interesting thing that they found is that making over that decreased happiness. And the reason was, is because most people who were earning more than that were in more stressful jobs or in more stressful situations. So as you earn more money, it actually decreased your happiness because you weren't taking time to enjoy it. You were probably working in a bigger job with more stress or more on call or all of that. Um, and that what, and then there's this book actually called the happiness project. And so she says that you should actually encourage your children into jobs that are middle of the ra- middle of the range because they're actually happier that if you make a certain amount yes that's going to ha- aid your happiness in life but to keep them out of the most stressful jobs because then they'll have a happier life and i thought that was such an interesting observation um and then this is great i when i was kind of doing a little bit of research about what's what's the happy income um there is i came across a little interview with warren buffett you guys all know him and he's he is 78.4 billion is what the man owns. And this is what he says, this little quote. He says, I'm already happy. I would be happy with, you know, certainly a hundred thousand dollars a year. I could be very happy. Buffett said on PBS news hour, I can buy anything. Basically Buffett says I have, I've been on a 400 foot yachts and I have lived the life a little bit with people that have 10 homes and everything. He says, and I live in the same house I bought in 1958. And it goes on. He says, I could spend a hundred million on a house and that would, 
uh, on a house, um, he said, he said, if I could spend a hundred million on a house that would make me a lot happier, I would do it. But for me, that's the happiest house in the world, the one that he bought in 1958, he said. And because it's got memories and people come back and that sort of thing. That's, so he's identified what happiness is. Happiness is, is owning his first house, you know, where his children grew up and where he has lots of memories and friends come back and, and relationships. Exactly. I thought that was such an interesting little quote and observation that he was saying, if I could buy a house that would make me happier, I would. But I can't buy a house that would make me happier because this house is what makes me happy. What was that? Love love within the walls. I love that. So Jesus is saying our life is not made happy by our possessions. And then he tells this parable. And um, an already wealthy man has an incredible year of crops. And he gets so much, they can't even store it in the storehouses that he currently has. And so since he has so much, you know, one might, option might be to give some of it away or to maybe sell some of it for cheap. But instead he says, I've got a solution. I'll build a bigger storehouse. That's my solution. And I was thinking, you know, are we ever guilty of this? Am I ever guilty of this? I'm I, I know I'm guilty of this. You know, our family is doing so well. We could buy a bigger house or I could shop more. It's easy to think shop more is me. Um, (laughs) but the question is, you know, when we do well, what do we do with that extra? I think that's the question that's being raised here. And the man's answer is, well, hoard it for myself. Um, with the, with the plan to spend time eating and drinking and being merry. Um, but what's the problem that's going to happen? What's the problem in the parable? He's going to, when is he going to die? He's going to die that night. So that's the problem in the parable. He's just going to die that night. So, um, so is the problem that the man is rich? No, that's not the problem. What's the problem? What he's doing with it. He's rich and selfish. That's the problem with it. So Jesus says the problem is to store up riches for ourselves, but not be rich towards God. That's the problem. Um, and so what does it mean to be rich towards God? What do you ladies think? How, how are we rich towards God? Generous. Generous. Resources, time. Yep, using resources and time, absolutely. Any other specific ways? Spending time with him, asking him what he wants us to do. Spending time with God, asking him what he wants us to do with his, our money. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, I think any time that we spend our resources on God, you know, whether it's, you know, giving money away, giving things away that you no longer need, you know, supporting missionaries, caring for orphans, like um, caring for the marginalized in society, that that's all good, you know, that that's using our extra that instead of storing it up in a storehouse for ourselves. Um, and I know that so many of us in this room, including me, have our worldly needs really met. And that, so the question is the same for us. What do we do with our abundance? And I really want to stress, this is not a guilt-laden question because this should be a joyful thing. It should be th- something that we're excited about and that, you know, who can I give to? Who can I support? What other, what ministries are out there that I can be excited to be part of? So, um, and, you know, I, it's interesting. I think many people have found that when they tie their income, their income increases. Has anyone had any exp- experience like that? Um, we've, we've tended to find it with my family that we've so we did not start at 10%, my husband and I, but we have slowly sort of increased the amount that we have been given and we have all, all that we need, you know, and that's been kind of a fun little thing for us. Um, you know, I think God wants us to be his hands and feet on the earth. And so when he sees someone who is being his hands and feet, then he wants to give them more opportunities to be his hands and feet, right? Because sure, God can do anything anytime, but he wants us to be involved. And if we're the kind of person or family that our res- that the money is coming to us and then being filtered out, then he's going to want to give us more because <laughs> he's excited by the work that we're able to fund, the things that we're able to do. So if the money he gives you is used to bless the world, he's likely going to give you more money. So the blessing and really, and blessing others brings us so much joy. I mean, I think of the most joyful times in my life have always been the times where I'm on some 
level of giving or being part of God's work in some incredible way. That that's the real joy is. So if any of you ladies are feeling guilty, that's not what this is about. And in fact, I once heard that Satan is the one who gives us guilt. God is the one who gives us conviction. So if you have felt any kind of sense of like guilt in listening to this, that's not from the Lord. The Lord loves to convict us and then send us off in excitement and energy to do his good works. Um, but at the same time, if any of you are feeling stirred, huh, this is something, a way that I could give more, some way, something I would like to do, then that's a good thing. And that's exciting. So, um, so then we don't, we won't read the next section. It's fitting then that Jesus then launches into teaching about do not worry. So that's his great, again, bookend to it. And, um, I'll read just the very end of the section from Luke 12, 29 through 34, where he says, and do not set your heart on what you would eat or drink. Do not worry about it for the pagan world runs after such things. Then your father knows that you need them, but seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail. Where no thief comes near, no moth destroys. For where our treasure is, there your heart will be also. So the main idea is where should we store up our treasure? Where do we store up our treasure? with the Lord in heaven. And then, so we think that, um, and I think we do that just by what we've been talking about. That that's how we store up our treasure in heaven, that spending our money is in ways that blesses others, builds Jesus's kingdom. Um, and then it's interesting that after this, Jesus then goes into a tell parable of watchfulness to say that um, the result of him coming is not peace, but division, because in the same family, some will follow him and some will not. And I think many of us have probably experienced that. Um, I want to spend some time on Jesus' teaching at the beginning of chapter 13. So I'm going to transition to that. That's the first. um, We're going to move to that. So we're skipping over to, so it's all kind of the same section of Jesus' teachings in Judea. Um, So I'm going to go to 13. I'm going to start with 1 through 5, and we'll go through this section. So now there was some president at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will perish. Okay, so some people come up to Jesus... They tell him that some Galileans were killed by Pilate while making their sacrifices. So we have to assume that this happened in Jerusalem because it's the only place where sacrifices occurred. Um, Josephus doesn't make any references to this account. So the only known information is right from here, from Luke. Um, For some reason, some Galileans were making sacrifices in the temple and Pilate took the opportunity to kill them. We know that Galilee was the place where rebellions began often. We remember that. And so maybe, this is just conjecture, but maybe Pilate deemed some as dangerous and nabbed them while they're in Jerusalem. We don't know. Um, But the question that Jesus asks is, were they sinful people that this bad thing happened to them? That's the question he's asking. Um, And the rhetorical nature of this question implies what kind of answer? No, exactly. So the bad thing happened to them Uh, So this bad thing didn't happen to them because they were bad people. Um, They weren't especially evil. And the thought of the day was that if something bad happened to you, you were a sinner. That was kind of the thought of the day. You were doing something bad. People ask the question, and I think sometimes even people ask that question now. Is my suffering a result of sin? I think we hear that, you know. Did I do something wrong that this is happening to me? And what is the answer that Jesus gives? No. no. He says no. He says, then Jesus references another historical event. The Tower of Siloam was likely part of Jerusalem's wall near the Pool of Siloam. Again, this is the only reference to it. We don't have a reference from Josephus. Um, it must have been an incident that recently occurred that Jesus is referencing. It's like, you know, a news event that he's referencing. Um, as part of the wall collapsed and in that process killed 18 people. 
So Jesus asked, were these the 18 biggest sinners in Jerusalem that this would happen to them? That's the question he asked. And, and Jesus asked, and you know, were they the 18 most sinful people? And the answer is no, they're not. And it seems that the point is to not focus on the degree of sinfulness of others, right? That we don't judge that others are sinners if something bad happens to them, that that's not the presumption that we make. That if someone's child is misbehaving, it's not because they're a bad mom, you know? Like, we we tend to do that, though. I think we do. Um, But so I think the idea is to instead focus on our own sin. Jesus says, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. And elsewhere, Jesus says, you know, take the log out of your own eye before you look at the speck in someone else's eye. And to me, that seems to be the focus. Do not judge the level of sinfulness of someone else around you, but focus on your own need for repentance. Where do I need to repent? Where do I need to take the log out of my eye? So the disasters that Jesus refers to also seem to be sort of symbolic of ultimate destruction, that unless listeners repent and believe in Jesus, sort of a greater destruction will occur, a destruction greater than the Galileans killed or the wall following on those in Jerusalem. So then Jesus tells a parable that's meant to illustrate this point. And this will be our last little bit for today. So 13, Luke 13, 6 through 8. Then he told them this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. All right, so in this parable, a fig tree isn't bearing fruit. And any idea who this fig tree might represent? People, right. And likely which people? The Jewish people, right. We've been talking, he... He's been warning against the use of the Pharisees. He's been speaking to this Jewish crowd around him. So the tree isn't bearing fruit. So the owner of the vineyard wants to do what? Cut it down. down. But the gardener intervenes and says, give me one more year. And he says, I'll spend extra time with it. I'll water it. We'll see if it will grow. And so if the fig tree represents Israel, what is God doing for it? He's giving it another chance. Totally. He's caring for it. He's so, um, but if the, in the parable, if the tree doesn't bear fruit in a year, what's going to happen? Cut it down. So we get the sense that judgment is being delayed, but it is not forever. So God is patiently trying to bring Israel, these first century Jewish people to him, that that's the goal. And that but God, but God will not be patient forever. The implication is that judgment still awaits. But I do love this image of God investing in this tree and nurturing the, this tree and wanting it to produce fruit. And so, this was like to the disciples to say, "You go be the gardeners, but also warn the people that they don't have forever." So you're wondering if sort of, uh, I mean, it, it could be part of that, addressing the disciples in, to be the gardeners. Yeah, that because they're going to be the ones that are going to be preaching uh, and giving that, being that nurturer. Yeah, there could be a sense of that. Right. Right. Yeah, I think the I think the image is God being that patient gardener here. Um, you know, and I think, again, we see his heart of wanting all people to come to himself. Elizabeth. Yeah, but, well, two weeks ago, he totally zapped the tree. Yeah, totally, two weeks ago, he zapped the tree. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. also, if we look at the payment to the workers. Yeah, the payment to the workers. Yeah, the ones that came at the very end still came in and got full payment. Yeah. Which is, these are great observations of you ladies, because this is what it means to study the whole canon of scripture is to take all of the stories that we know and to balance them against each other. 
And, you know, when someone likes to take one scripture out and have it be sort of say what they wanted to say, that's what we call proof texting. So, you know, I wanted to say this. I'm going to bring it. Look at this. But we have to always balance the full canon. (laughs) Totally. So, you know, I guess that we balance this sort of loving investment of God with final judgment. And any questions, ladies, from what we have covered today? Yeah. I think he does. I think you're right. I think he does call us all to be that gardener. Totally. To be the one who you know, is loving on other people, wanting them to, to hear his word and to receive his love. But the one thing is we're not called to be that judge. We're not the one who cuts, who cuts the, off the tree. Deanne? One of the things I think I have learned most from your study or, or I've had an attention to is when we're looking at all these things to see to whom he is speaking. Right, who is God actually does, speaking to. It does go back between the crowd right. and the Totally. Absolutely. I agree. It is. I found that really fascinating too, to look at who is he speaking to? Is it disciples? Is it the crowds? Um, and then again, knowing the context of these disciples he's teaching right now are about to like go into this crazy experience of the Holy Spirit coming on them, you know, death and resurrection. And they're going to be set forth to share Jesus to the entire world. Like it's really interesting to, to see these teachings based on what's about to happen. I agree. I think that's, I love that you're noticing that because to me, that's when scripture comes alive is when I see the context and I, I, it just makes me understand it so much more. Um, so Luke, after this, I'm not going to go into it, then recounts two more stories of Sabbath healings, a crippled woman, a man at a Pharisee's house. We won't read them because they're really similar messages to what we've already been talking about. Um, and kind of his little, Punchline is, again, caring for the person versus the, the oral tradition, the oral law. Uh, and what's interesting, too, is that um, oh, and at the end of that, the people are delighted by his response. They think it's great that he sort of tells off the Pharisees. And so we kind of get this, again, this picture of Jesus being very popular with the masses, but feared by the Pharisees. And that's this growing sense that's going to continue growing. Um, because we also have to, you know, one question I have asked so many times or asked growing up a lot, is I didn't understand where these masses of people came from on Palm Sunday, and then why it was only a week later that he was killed. That was something that didn't really make sense to me. But I think we can kind of see where these masses are coming from. There's thousands of people that are listening to him teach, you know, outside of Jerusalem. So uh, that's fast forwarding, and we'll get there. But um, the one parable that we didn't go through that was kind of in our study today, or that's part of our study today, um, is the parable of the banquet from Luke fourteen fifteen through 24. So if any of you ladies want to read that for homework, kind of report back. And with parables, again, there's usually one main idea that Jesus is teaching, one point. And so I'd love to hear from any of you ladies what that main point is. Um, I did purposely try and end um, a little bit more closer to 10 30 today so for those of you who can hang out for 10 minutes and chat with you i did chat with each other i put questions on your tables um i you do not have to stick to these questions but ideas i had were to talk about um, how jesus says god knows the number of hairs on our heads you know what feelings or responses or thoughts do you have from knowing god knows you that intimately does that give you assurance to you in any particular area of your life or in any of your relationships right now it's one thing you could talk about Another one is we know that the goal is to store up treasure in heaven. Is there any way that you would love to be more invested in God's kingdom work? Is there anything you're kind of excited about that you'd like to be part of? That's something you could share ideas and encourage each other. And then um, any observations, obviously, you had today or any praises or prayer requests. For those of you who need to go, that's great. For those of you who can hang out and talk, great. And I'll close this. Uh, Thank you, Jesus, for this time we have had in your word. And thank you for these great um, reminders of who you are, of your incredible power and authority, but the way you care for us so intimately is incredible. And thank you for the reminder, Jesus, to be excited about the work that you have for us here on earth. And I pray that all of these women here in this room will find ways to tap into your kingdom work that fills them with joy and excitement that they're thrilled about. And I pray that you will find, um, that all these ladies will just find great purpose in you and in the lives that they're leading. 
We pray that as we go from here, that you will protect all of us, protect our families. I pray that um, you will also give us a deep sense of your presence today, that you walk with us, and that you will give us an opportunity to love, bless, or encourage someone else that we come across. And as we do have these conversations with people, I pray that you will give us that sense of being tuned to your spirit, of knowing what to say to them, how to encourage and love those around us. In your powerful name we pray, Jesus. Amen.